it is my honor to introduce you to our speakers for today, starting with Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Coakley. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I am a little person. You can't tell that because I'm just sitting down. Um, but I have shoulder length red hair with a lot of gray because I haven't been able to get my hair dyed since COVID. Um, I have, am wearing a sort of like brickish red slash brown lipstick wearing a black blazer and a green top, sitting in front of a green wall um, with a map from Middle Earth. I had to check which nerdy map I was in front of. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Hey, I'll go for it. Um, my name is Leah Lakshmi Piepshna Samrasinghe. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I am yet another autistic non-binary femme in their 40s. Um, I have more gray hair than Rebecca. I look like an aging, um, middle-aged, mixed-race, Sri Lankan, Roma punk. Um, I've got brown and gray curly hair on one side. These amazing spoon witch earrings, where if you are low on spoons and you need one, you can get these from... Oh shit, my friend Lex on script is Etsy, which I'm blanking on right now. And I'm wearing a black t-shirt that has my favorite um, comic, SFSX. It's about a bunch of sex workers that fight back against patriarchal Christianity. And hot pink lipstick. I'm really glad to be here. Hi, I'm Leslie Templeton. Um, I'm with the Women's March and their disability coordinator. Um, I do a lot of work around sexual assault and disability and also just disability in general. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am a ginger red hair down to mid, about midway through my back. Um, I'm wearing a uh, shoulderless uh, blue dress in front of a dresser and a blue wall. All right, well, I thought we'd just dive right in with our first question. Given that trauma is a disability, whether it's mental or physical, why should organizations that do work in the space of violence include a disability justice lens as part of their day-to-day -day business? Can I go? Go ahead. Okay. Go for it. So for some people who may be new to the definition and history of disability justice, I want to start out by saying it was created by disabled Black, Asian, and full white queer and trans folks um, who were revolutionaries who had a radical intersectional analysis of, of disability. So for me, when I hear, you know, what, why do people, when I hear that question, I'm like, well, if we bring a disability justice lens into doing sexual assault and IPV work, it means looking at the sexual assaults of disabled black and brown folks in prison, in institutions, in psych wards. It means lifting up um, the knowledge and leadership of the many, many, many disabled sex workers who are out there who are being slaughtered by sesta -fosta. Um, it means listening to the voice of, of, disabled, of disabled trafficking survivors um, and looking at how the trafficking movement is really um, taking a lot of money and not actually centering a lot of trafficking survivors. And to me, I also just want to say, because I've written about this, um, there's a lot of ableism in the ways in which healing is defined traditionally in a lot of traditional survivor services. Um, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and adult sexual assault, and even going to progressive feminist POC therapist, there was this idea of like, ooh, you know, rape breaks you and then you're fixed. And as disabled people, we actually know, you know, Eli Clare for one has written really eloquently as a disabled white trans survivor about actually being like, screw cure. Um, you know, for a lot of people who are survivors, I'm like, oh, so you're a neurodiverse now. So it doesn't mean that someday you're gonna get back to normal and that's what being cured is. It means that actually disabled people and disability justice has a lot to teach you about the wisdom and the disabled life, ha life hacks of living with PTSD and complex trauma. So you don't have to go back to normie never rape to be able to be a really beautiful, fierce survivor with an amazing life. That's my short version. Yes. <laughs> That's a great start, Leah. Look, I feel like you said everything that needed to be said. But I Sorry, was, I was just like, I'm going to go first. No, Wait, you was on a roll. Go. Somebody no, go. That was beautifully said. You was on a roll. Leslie, Rebecca, what you got? Um, you said it all. I mean, I think it's really important to talk about, like, you even brought up intersectionality around sexual assault and disability. I think a lot of the times when we think of disability, 
And even in terms of sexual assault, we see that this monolith, a lot of times we think of a white woman, that was the first thing that comes to mind. And we don't understand that because of multi-marginalizations, sexual trauma can look different to everyone and right. how it impacts them. I mean, even access to resources, access, even accessibility in certain areas, trying to get sexual assault resources in lower income areas may be different than trying to get uh, access to resources in the higher income areas that are accessible. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we, when we talk about sex, sexual assault, sexual violence with the disability community, we also always talk about how this you can become disabled from it, but also you can be disabled before and how that impacts your disability. I know that after mine, I had an increased seizures um, mm -hmm. and there was no real resources to understand like my mental health, my physical health is getting worse now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think that's like some of the most important things when we're talking about disability and sexual violence uh, with organizations. You know, I think in, in my perspective, this is Rebecca, um, one of the things that I continue to find myself thinking about is a lot of times where we face assault, where we face violence might be within our own subsection of the disability community. Yeah. And then when we come home, whether it be something that, and, and it's been something I've heard universally being, being a little person, our um, conferences are epic. Our conferences are looked at from other folks in other parts of the disability community. It was like, oh, I heard those little people conventions are bananas. Um, you know, I've also heard similar things in the, in the blind community and I've heard things in the neurodiverse community where people, everybody knows who the abusers are. Everybody knows who's the problematic person, but because there is not language, there is not interest in addressing those issues within the, the smaller segments of the disability community when that survivor comes home or is in, a, is in a place where they can actually access services, it's external to that community. And so there isn't that context, there isn't that ability for recognition of the trauma that we experience a lot of times at the hands of our, of our peers, at the hands of the people that we should be able to look to for peer support and for acceptance. Um, and just the, the need for outside organizations to realize that this is both sort of an inside and an outside thing, and that there is the need for the knowledge translation across a lot of those spaces, and also the belief and the trust that we are the experts of our own experience. I mean, I've had friends tell me that, you know, coming back from a conference after being assaulted, they went to their campus provider and they're like, oh, I'm sure that does. I'm sure you just misunderstood it. Or, you know, maybe they're just really lonely because there's nobody else like them. And so you guys get together for a week and like, no, that's not OK. It's never OK. No. Um, and actually creating those expectations in the non-disabled community when disabled people are sharing their self-experience. Mm -hmm. And I want to add. Oh, Go ahead. You know, I want to add here, this is by Lisa, as a social worker, just the professional lens of the fact that this isn't discussed in our professions, whether it's in our trainings and our programs to the conferences that we go to, rarely do we hear about disability justice and violence, domestic um, intimate partner, you know, doesn't really matter, you know, and I really feel that that gap is why organizations don't have that lens why a lot of practitioners do not know how to engage with disabled people from a lens that is more appropriate to us, that doesn't lean into the medical model, doesn't lean into the trauma, doesn't lead into just centering mm -hmm. the disability only and not looking at us through a holistic, full lens. So that gap starts, you know, on the professional end as to why uh, organizations and those within them have this severe, severe you know, incapability of understanding disability in general, much less disability justice. Yeah, if I can add one thing, is that okay? I just was gonna say that, you know, we're talking about disability justice and, you know, Vilissa, what you were just saying, I mean, I worked in mainstream great crisis for 10 years. I mean, we were a very women of color, queer, anti-racist hotline, but, and we had some disability awareness, but we were still up a flight of stairs. We still had like the whole stuff being like, oh, there's a TTY, but we don't know how it works. And, you know, just, and it's 20 years later and a lot of services are still there. They're like, and they're still saying they're like, oh, well, we're in an old Victorian story. There's no money to renovate. Just real basic access stuff. Right. And then you've got the stuff where, Rebecca, when you were talking, I was like, right, like most of Abled World, they still don't get that disabled people have communities, like that we yeah. hang out. 
right? Like, so, so that small community thing is so huge. And we as disabled people know our communities are so precious and our life support. And we actually, whether or not we believe in transformative justice, often we're like, I don't want to throw that person in jail. I don't want to throw another disabled person, you know, under the bus, but I need sexual assault to stop happening. And then you're in this tiny little community where people are real independent. It's real hard. And then on top of all, going back to abled world, you've still got people, including mainstream non-disabled providers, falling into the dichotomy that's so old and tired of, oh, disabled people, oh, you have sex? Like not believing that disabled people have agency or sexuality. And on the other hand, seeing some of us as hypersexual super predators. And in the middle, it's the stuff that I think we've all been touching on about, oh, did you know, did you make that up? We're like, one of the ways ableism comes in is competency, right? Which specifically affects people with mental health, neurodivergent and psychiatric disabilities, but also hits disabled people across the board of like, oh, you're some cripple. You must not know what rape is, you know? And then specifically, sorry, last thing. I mean, I just want to give a shout out to, you know, so many autistic activists have spoken about the specific effect to lift up uh, applied behavioral analysis as being a treatment that literally teaches autistic kids to not believe our own understandings of what's happening, which then raises us as neuro weird kids to be like, oh, well, I can't trust myself. That didn't feel good, but no, no, no. I, I have to listen to what normie guy is saying over there. So we're based, like ABA is basically medical gaslighting um, mixed in with electroshocks. And, you know, for a lot of parents of autistic kids, they're still being told, oh, this is the creme to the creme of the treatment for your kid. So yeah, I mean, I'll just stop there, but like you, these are all the things, these are some of all the things that we in the movement have to be dealing with. Yeah, it is. Well, I thought we could continue to dive in, go to our next question, which is what are the gaps in services? I think we kind of went over this a little bit, yeah. um, that impact say, with people structurally and programmatically within the domestic violence space. I think it's even just the conversation that domestic violence is an issue for disabled people. I mean, I think just as, as Leah pointed out, you know, how people are shocked that disabled people have sex. Mm -hmm. People are equally shocked when they meet a disabled person in a relationship. I mean, I remember when my partner and I first started dating and I took him to a conference that I was speaking at in Orlando um, with all these young people. And like all these young people pulled me aside and were like, you have a boyfriend? Like, oh my God, how did you meet him? Um, like, and, and we ended up in this like long conversation because they had never seen a disabled person in a relationship before. They didn't know it was a thing um, or it could be a thing. And, and actually like having that conversation with them. And then I realized as somebody, as a yelder, as like a young elder to them, like I had a responsibility to talk to them about like healthy relationships because all these, like several of these young women were like, oh, well, if you can, I'm going to go get a boyfriend and I'm just going to like date this other guy in the group who might be a total asshole <laughs> and might be really mean, but it's okay. Cause I have a boyfriend. And I remember like sitting a bunch of them down and being like, that's not okay. Like, that's not, that's not how this all works. Um, but realizing that for them, like they had been told even by their parents, like one of them, I remember even working at, um, one of the big warehouses for Walgreens and, and thankfully they're not there anymore, but the CEO of Walgreens like publicly saying disabled people don't have friends, disabled people don't have relationships. And that's why I'm doing this, this charity. And she and her family had totally internalized this message. Um, and so when, when she was ready to leave this relationship and get assistance, they were like, but you know, have, I think he really does love you. I think maybe it's a disability thing. And like that being the response from the, the IPV space, mm-hmm. um, instead of centering her experiences, like they were like separating her from her, from the disability piece and viewing the disability as like reasoning as justification for the violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I just talked a lot. Leslie, do you want to go? Sure. Um, Well, what I wanted to bring up, too, is that uh, accessibility in these spaces is really a big issue. I mean, accessibility, ASL interpreters, um, making uh, websites accessible for people who are blind or have visual disabilities. Um, All these things create barriers to people getting the help they need. And I think that's part of the reason why sexual violence and domestic violence is so high within the disability community with uh, us being survivors and everything. It's because there aren't a lot of resources that are made to make sure that we have complete access to them. Um, it's really hard to find resources that you can 
find accessible, even resources that we see on the internet, not, they don't always have trigger warnings that could be triggering. Um, and then also when we talk about disability, a lot of the times when you are neurodivergent, you may be able passing. And so a lot of the times when you're in these organizations, getting the help you need can be an extra barrier trying to explain, I also have this and this is what I need. And proving that you do have this greater need and uh, need to talk to someone about having a disability and having this kind of trauma and how trauma can impact that disability um, and how they're bi-directional with each other. Yeah, you know, and I think for me as a, social worker, just looking at our programs, you know, having a background in psychology and social work, I heard nothing about the disability specific issues of domestic violence or sexual violence until I became an activist. And that's very troubling to where we have professionals in these fields that don't know what to look for that's disability specific, you know, when it comes to intimidation, you know, when it comes to um, medical abuse, you know, people withholding things, you know, withholding medical equipment, medical supplies from us, financial abuse of uh, disabled people, the things where it doesn't leave bruises, you know, physical bruises, you know, that people are not aware of to ask these questions, or even it stems from, you know, us not learning about these things in schools. You know, how many of us haven't had second education through K through 12 to learn about consent, to learn about good touch, bad touch, to learn about what abuse is, you know, or anything like that. So a lot of, you know, professionals, whether it's educators, social workers like myself, have failed to say with people in providing information, providing that support, and then coming into the worlds that we are in, and ensuring that the materials are accessible, make sure that they're disability specific, make sure that materials are a little bit in braille and large print, making sure that um, our facilities are um, not just which is suspect, but suspect in other ways, a little bit what Leah had touched on earlier. So there's a lot of the structural and programmatic things that are really lacking that causes more harm for us outside of the, outside of the actual harm that we're enduring every day. I just want to add a couple things, like um, just kind of jumping back to what Rebecca was saying about like, you know, a lot of disabled young people still being like, oh shit, you can date. I think that on the flip side, I think with providers, there's that and there's also a lack of understanding that as disabled people, we have relationships in different ways, right? So a lot of us may have really intimate relationships that aren't necessarily sexual. Some of us are asexual. So, but then, you know, in the traditional mindset, it's like, oh no, it's your boyfriend or your girlfriend. That's who you're yeah. looking at. And then if you go, no, we don't fuck, but this is in like an abled neurotypical way, but this is my person. And they're also my caregiver who I trust with things I don't trust other people with maybe and it's starting to go sour because there's a real power imbalance there that's something that's not even on the radar of so many providers and then you've got the honestly often the kind of provider well why don't you just leave and a complete lack of understanding of i mean i've talked to so many people who are like i would move out but it took us a year to find this accessible apartment Right. right. And like, do you have another one that you can just dial up for me? Is it on section eight? Like really understanding that. And then you've got these products like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, mm, I hear there's a waiting list and you're just like, just shoot me. Right. Um, I also just really want to shout out. I, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking and writing about um, both desirability and how it intersects with ableism, because that's a huge thing. I mean, there's the element of, oh, I didn't know we could date. But there's also the element of you know, just so much internalized ableism of like, if someone will date you, you better just stick with them and be real grateful because right. there might not be anybody else. And the way that's in, like, you know, we talk about structural changes. I'm like, right. So how many times have people been on Tinder and an online site? And maybe it doesn't say chicks and chairs are gross. Maybe it does. But it also will say things like, oh, no baggage, right? Which is just code for don't be neurodiverse, don't have a mental health disability, right? And so many disabled people I know have stayed in relationships that got abusive way too long, both because of that feeling of like, there's not going to be anybody else. And maybe I depend on my partner for care, but also for intimacy, for love, for all the things. And then I just want to say, like, there's ways that internalized ableism gets in us where we're not aware, like the stuff that I listed was talking about, we're not even aware, oh, that's abuse like I had a partner you know oh, almost 20 years ago now who I was like great she's not physically abusive this is cool but she was very you know able-bodied tough you know you just power through it 
really had a thing where she would minimize my disabilities and my chronic illnesses, like that some bougie stuff. And, you know, I didn't have language for when I slipped and fell in the shower. And I was like, I need a shower turn. She laughed at me. Like 10 years later, when I was in disability justice community, I was like, oh, that's abuse, right? That was her minimizing my disability. That was me, her mocking me for having an access need. You know, that was her using emotional manipulation to make me feel bad for having that. But if you'd asked me then, I would have been like, oh, no, it's just I, things are hard. But I don't know. I guess it's just me. Right. I am weak. And if you don't have language to identify, you know, specific abusive dynamics that are tied with ableism, it's going to take you a longer time to get out of the relationship of the situation. And then when, you know, ye old rape Christ Center doesn't have that in your their wheelhouse either, you're pretty much shit out of luck. Well, and you I know, think I want to can, can I add on to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I add yeah. on to what Leah was saying? Because it's something I've been thinking about a lot, especially now that I'm a mom um, and I have three mm-hmm. kids. Um, I'm on all these listservs for parents of kids with disabilities, um, probably parents of kids uh, that are little people. And I've had to push back a lot because I watch the num- the amount of information these parents put out there about their children and like these graphic photographs mm-hmm. that parents will put out for the sake of educating each other. And A, it's triggering as hell for a lot of us that are little people that are watching this that are like, what the hell are you doing? Don't put this up. Like what, this is the internet. This is Facebook. This is gonna be here for forever. Um, and then we end up getting getting pushed back and hate on that. But also the, 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 the role that family and the medical profession plays in divorcing you from your body as a disabled person um, you know, and I think it was really interesting when you heard the, the abuse case of the Olympic gymnasts talking about how they, like, they felt divorced from their bodies, like, because right. of their body being commodified in the work that they do. And I think a lot of times as disabled people, we, because of the medical industrial complex, because of ableism, like, we've been taught, like, oh, any able-bodied person has a right to see your body has a right to point out things on your body. If they're a doctor, if they're a social worker, like make your, and and also the, the conflict of having to make your story as traumatic as possible in certain cases in order to get the benefits you might need in order to survive right. for a lot of people and how that plays out in abuse and, and interpersonal violence um, where it's like, I, I've talked to, to people and they're like, oh yeah, no, like, wait, I can say no if somebody wants, if somebody touches me. Yeah. I've never been told that I could say no, or yeah. I've never been told that what the doctor is doing is actually abuse. Like I've always been told that the doctor is the expert by my family, by society, and like, just trust the doctor. And like, I've had to sit there with friends of mine and be like, no, it's not okay. Like you are being abused by your physician who is in a position of power and authority. And you've been conditioned to believe that this behavior is okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the words of the website, Real Social Skills, non-compliance is a social skill. And as disabled folks, as neurodivergent folks, we are taught, I mean, they call it compliance training. Like, that's yeah. what the kids are literally taught. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing that I want rape crisis and IPV services to get into is like, oh, what do disabled survivors need? Disabled survivors need to be connected with disabled activism and community that's going to be like, no, you can say no to the doctor. Screw the doctor. You can say no to compliance training. You can learn how to retrust yourself. That's what's going to liberate us. It is. And that kind of goes into our, you know, next question of what are challenges and barriers that disabled people face in reporting sexual or domestic violence? Um, I would love to talk about that, actually, because there's a lot going on. I mean, we talk about police brutality right now, especially for Black disabled people. Um, It could be hard to go to the police. I mean, we see 30 to 50 percent of people who are killed by police are disabled. The idea of putting yourself in that situation or calling the police, being like, come, there's something going on, you could be directly putting yourself in danger. So it makes it, there's that barrier of getting the help that you need in the legal sense. Um, There's also just, again, accessibility. Um, You know, when you're in a relationship, someone could be holding uh, their financial uh, power over you. They could be, like with asset limits, it could be hard to get out of of a house um, and trying to find a new house. All these other things that make it harder for someone. They discourage someone from reporting because it could cause problems with their everyday life and being able to access the things they need. I always say accessibility is part of the reason why we have such high rates of domestic violence, of sexual violence, of sexual assault in our communities. 
because it makes us have to stay in these positions with our caregivers, with our with people we're in relationships with, the people we rely on every day. Um, and if we we need to figure out ways to protect people in our community um, and also talk about these issues with reporting. We do. No, that's a great point, Leslie. And I think another point we need to make that's been touched on is the fear of reporting. You know, will you be believed? You know, will someone take your, your abuse seriously? You know, particularly with some of the ways in which we can't be abused that we went over. Some people not even regard that as abuse. Some people be like, oh, you know, they don't mean that. Just diminish it. And also a little bit of education piece that I mentioned earlier. Many of us may not know what abuse looks like, you know, because it's been so normalized from us at birth, you know, when it comes to our bodies to adulthood, that we do trivialize it, that we do diminish it and at times blame ourselves. So there's a lot of victim blaming in first off recognizing abuse and then getting the courage to um, report it. And then what happens after that? What kind of supports will you receive? A little bit of what was touched on earlier was about the accessibility aspect. You know, where do you go? Particularly if you're somebody who um, requires a lot of care, who's going to manage your care or at least assist you with care? If your abuser is your primary caregiver, who's going to assist you with that? You know, these are a lot of factors in which we have to think about as to how somebody's life can change if they were to report it and possibly being isolated, not having a lot of community to lean in on as they figure out what that next step looks like. I think also building off what you said with the community, um, especially if you're in a relationship with someone else in your community, like Rebecca was even talking about earlier, it could be harder for you to get out because you've built this relationship, the circle of support systems around this relationship. And this person's probably with like in that circle of support. So it can isolate you. I always say like, I never talk about who my, uh, who my abuser was. Um, I never name names because I'm always scared that I'm going to face backlash. Everybody wants to support you when there's no name, but the second you name someone that can change the entire aspect, you can be villainized, you can be hurt. And then also even going to try to talk to someone about it. I think infantilization of disabilities is a big part of it too. People are like, Oh, like no one hate. They're also, they're like, no one hates people with disabilities. No one would do that to a disabled person. Like people love disabled people. Like, cause it's all this whole idea that like, we should be thankful that people like us, like we can't face any discrimination. We can't face anything bad because people love disabled people. They love helping us. It's a whole inspiration point. I think also adds to that because it's the idea that we make everyone feel good. So why would anybody want to make us feel bad or want to hurt us? Um, and that also creates barrier to care and barrier to reporting. Yeah, I mean, people just think of disabled people as the Smurfs, you know, like, they're just, like <laughs> really real. And I mean, I think that leads into like, you know, what do we mean when we think about disabled survivors, right? Like, I mean, why does disabled survivors not report? Why does anyone not report? It's kind of like, so as a survivor, what do you get out of it? You know, like, are you going to get a conviction? Do you want a conviction? Are you going to be brutalized and re-traumatized while that happens? Um, you know, when I think about disabled survivors, I think about the fact that a lot of cops are rapists, right? So like, mm -hmm. are we thinking about a lens of disability where it's a white, straight, cis, disabled person, right? Or are we thinking about like disabled sex workers who are raped by cops on the beat, right? And they're just like, I'm not gonna go to the system. Um, I think about my own experience as, which is so common and which is a really good example of, you know, how ableism is in everything. Where as a young childhood sexual abuse survivor, right? Like. I mean, my parents were like, you don't tell anyone anything, dot, 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 because you're going to be taken to foster care by CPS. And years ago, when I was working for Generation 5, which um, has now morphed into the Bay Area Transformative Justice Coalition, but for years was an organization that was looking at what, what it would take to end childhood sexual abuse in five generations from a transformative justice perspective. The first workshop I ever attended that we did, the facilitator was like, okay, you know, so put up your hand if you're a survivor, you know someone who is of CSA. Everyone puts their hands up. And then she goes, okay, so who here was helped by CPS? Nobody, right? So that's the thing. I mean, that's why transformative justice is not just this kind of academic abstract, we hate the cops for no reason thing. It's that people know that CPS takes you out of being raped by your family and puts you into being raped by foster care or an institution. 
So, you know, for young survivors, they're like, I don't usually really want that. I'm going to stick with the devil I know, or I'm going to run away, or I'm going to disassociate. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, right. Yeah, in a nutshell. <laughs> And then on top of, you know, there's no ASL at the precinct usually or ramp or, you know, anything. So, yeah, I can't, you know, I have a friend who's like, when you literally can't even get in the door, right? Like, because of lack of access, there's that too. I mean, it was funny when when I was running the National Council on Disability, um, as a survivor, I really, I pushed the council to actually, we did a report on campus sexual assault programs. Right. And um, because we wanted, it was the same time as, as It's On Us was up and Me Too was grow, it was blowing up and like all, there was, there was such a, an attention on this issue. And I was, and I never saw an explicit le- DJ lens on any of these things. Um, and so I, 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 you know, we commissioned a survey and of, of college campuses of like over 700 college campuses and looked at what are their pro- what are their campus sexual assault programs have around issues around assault of people with disabilities, mm-hmm. um, like around accommodations, around even language that was disability inclusive. Like, do they have a number to call? Do they have you know a TTY, God forbid, you know, or two tin cans that are put together? If we're going all the way back to when people use TTYs, um, do they have a texting hotline? Like. What, what supports are available? How is campus security trained on meeting the needs of students with disabilities? And quite literally, what we found was nothing. Right. Like I had never had a report in my, in my five years at NCD and my 20 plus years of doing this work where literally we put a page in the report that said best practices on campus sexual assault on students with disabilities. This page is intentionally blank. There are none. Right. Because we couldn't find it anywhere. Right. Um, and because there was nothing. And there was even in talking to the disabled, the disability student groups on campus and saying like, what, like, are y'all engaged? Like, is this, a, it, and everybody said, this is a problem on our campus, but we don't even know where to start for help because when, you know, we just, we handle it ourselves internally. Right. And for a lot of folks, it just meant we suck it up and deal with it. Right. Like within and and have a talk and you know and internalize the ableism, internalize the sexism, internalize the homophobia, etc. Um, because there were no options. There were no. There was like inclusion was laughable. I'm so glad you brought that up about campus, like sexual assault, domestic violence. Like I mean, after my, uh, after what happened to me, I was having seizures, and my seizures increased exponentially just because of stress is one of my biggest triggers. Um, I wasn't leaving my room. I probably left my room a handful of times and trying to explain that to professors, like I'm dealing with not only this trauma, but it's also impacting my health. I had professors telling me that, oh no, you're just lying. You're just trying to get out of things because there's so many things going on at once. Instead of realizing, wow, that stress is actually impacting my physical health too. So there's two aspects that are going on. I'm scared to see people. I don't trust the people I see anymore. I'm also dealing with an extreme health issue where I've ended up in the hospital because of it. Mm -hmm. And after that, because of people not understanding, especially on the perfect, like with professors, like there's one thing on the institutional level and there's another thing with the interpersonal relationship with professors. Um, They don't understand that number one, the trauma aspect that can come out of it. And I was a psychology major. So my teachers were psychologists. So the fact that they didn't understand the aspects of trauma and how that impacts your physical health too, and how both of those can cause issues with me getting to class, me handing in work on time, I failed classes. I couldn't get to class. I couldn't understand what was going on. When I was there, I was dissociating. I couldn't remember what day it was or what was going on that day or what I learned that day. I was having seizures all the time. It was unsafe for me to leave my room sometimes. I had to have friends bring me food. Um, And there weren't, as much as I had some administrators try to help me, there wasn't a lot of protections in place for that. Um, they were like, well, we can make some times that you have absences that are, uh, that are excused, but not every absence was excused. Right. If it wasn't around my physical health, it wasn't excused. And I trying to get all my work done in time was ridiculously hard. Um, and it didn't help when I had professors telling me that I'm faking this. I'm looking for attention. I'm trying to come up with good excuses and having to justify your trauma and your physical health at the same time and how those are bi-directionally related um, is awful. And that happens a lot. I'm not the only one who dealt with that, who was disabled on campus. Um, that is a very common reaction with professors because professors t- 
tend not, we, I was lucky to have one professor who was very understanding, but I had a lot of professors who weren't. And that's a huge trend on college campuses. Even if the administration is good, even the individual departments or professors can make life tough for people who are going through these experiences. Right, and so should be done really on our campuses. Sorry. I said, what should be done on our campuses to address this matter for disabled students and the collective student body? Um, well, with my experience, one of the things is that when people have mental health problems, a lot of times they're forced off campus. Mm -hmm. Schools don't want to have that liability. So they're forced off campus and they can be put into situations, again, where they're facing this violence, um, which I think is really, really problematic. Either they're going to be moving back in with their parents or they're moving back in with an abuser because they're not allowed on campus. Um, usually they say like, you have to have a letter from a psychologist or a letter from a doctor and it has to be over like a year. And so that also creates barriers for people who have been survivors who may not have the money to go get a therapist note, to get a doctor's note. Um, and it makes it harder for survivors to finish college. Um, it also makes it harder for survivors to be safe. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. college campuses are the only place they can go because every, anywhere else they have is traumatic. Uh, could be where their abuser is, um, or could just be triggering in general. Um, so a lot of the times when you have these mental health problems that come from trauma like this, um, you don't have anyone, you don't have anywhere to go, um, and you're forced off campus. So talking to colleges about ending that practice is incredibly important, I personally think. I think that it's one of the worst practices out there. And it's all about, they don't want to have the liability of someone with mental health problems. They're like, well, we don't want to deal with you. You're bringing down our grades. You could hurt yourself and then we get sued, like all these other things. Um, and so it hurts students. It hurts the people who are going through the, some of the worst things they could go through. Can I have one thing? On college campus, having people illness on campus. Sorry. Say that again, Rebecca. I don't know if that was Rebecca. Hmm. Go ahead, Leah. Okay, I was just gonna, Leslie, thank you for everything you just shared. Yes. Um, seriously, and just the two quick things I want to add are, you know, when you were first talking, I was like, right, this is another intersection because even when you're not a survivor, when you're a disabled person and you're a student, you know, in order to get accommodations, you need to bring your proof, right? And like that's yeah. a huge barrier for so many people who are like, you know, my doctor, you know, I can't get a doctor to take me seriously. Or people I know who have been disabled since birth who are like, you want me to bring proof that I have cerebral palsy, really? Like it's not gonna change, you know, or stuff like that. You know, so many things. And where there's just a presumption that as disabled people, we're lying, we're cheats, and we're trying to get over. And, you know, it's, um, so I'm just thinking in terms of how different would it be on campus if we change that from this kind of legalistic framework of you got to prove it, you've got to bring, like they literally say you got to bring your proof to yeah. you yeah. as a person with a body and a mind know what your needs are and you get to say what those access needs are, right? Exactly. And they're not going to be punished for them and that there's going to be built in access throughout yeah. the campus system right mm -hmm. that's one thing and then i mean so i briefly for a year um, was the director of the d center which is the disabled deaf student center at university of washington seattle which at the time was one of four student centers in all of the united states by and for disabled students that wasn't like the access center where you go and beg for your accommodations to a bunch of able people but like a disabled cultural center where people could hang out and what I also was just thinking is like, what's needed is there needs to be more space by and for disabled students to come together. And it's huge because, you know, a lot of disabled students are like, don't call me that. I just want to be normal. And then you've got people who are like, well, I have generalized anxiety, but I don't know if I count, right? Yeah, it's the whole thing, like, I have to count. Like, right. can, I mean, I had students be like, am I allowed to step in here without a letter from a doctor? And I was like, yeah, we have a couch, sit down. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I mean, it's taking me back to something I was thinking about earlier, which is, I think, off the thing Rebecca said, which was, I want more, like, disabled, healthy relationship and healthy sexuality courses. There's some great stuff on disabled sexuality. They're, like, by the Empowered Fifi's, Cripping Up Sex with Eva, Sins Invalid. You know, lots of places are doing that work. Laurie Erickson's been so important. But I also want a place where we can talk about our relationships as disabled people and be like, 
And, you know, there's a few places I'm thinking of the Northwest Network was really crucial in Seattle to be a queer and trans um, sexual violence center that was like, let's talk about what healthy sexuality and healthy relationships look like for us as queer people, because we don't get a chance to learn those skills in a straight world. I think as disabled people, we need a space to be like, hey, I think it's good. Wait, it's gotten a little weird. Wait, I need some tools, you know? Um, right. And I think we also need disabled survivor spaces, which offhand in terms of organized spaces, I can't think of any on campus. The two I'm aware of are San Francisco Women Against Rape and API Chaya, which is an Asian Pacific Islander um, sexual assault, sexual health um, center in Seattle. And I think it's really important to note that it's not an accident that those are both rape crisis centers that are led by feminists of color who had some linkages with disability justice organizing, like Sins and Ballad co-sponsored that group in the Bay. Um, and we need like 5 million of those because just yeah. for us to be able to get yeah. in the door. And, you know, now we're all on Zoom, but pre-COVID, those groups were really groundbreaking in that they were like, of course we have ASL, of course we have court, of course you can Zoom in if you can't, if you're in your bed. We need to just normalize that access. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know we have some more questions. I'm going to stop there. But yeah, we, just, we need that. We need to be able to come together as disabled people to talk about our survivor issues. No, I think that, you know, a little bit what everybody has pointed to kind of leads us to our next question is the gaps in data. You know, we understand that disabled people, disabled queer people, you know, are, you know, survivors of this, but the data do not always show that. So what can we do to ensure that we have the numbers, we have the statistics, you know, we have the narratives that paints a more accurate picture of what's going on for this community? You know, I think part of it is the questions that we ask. I think particularly for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, the questions that we ask are often not accessible. And like the places that those questions are asked, I think the fact that we, a lot of times where disabled people have questions asked of them are doctor's offices. And you might be there with your parent. You might be there with your, your abuser. I remember um, I have a, in addition to my dwarfism, I have a funky cardiac nerve that my cardiologist calls Sarah Palin because it acts <laughs> up about every three years or so. And then we need to zap her. And then she goes away for a few years. Um, and Sarah was acting up. So we were at the hospital and it was in the middle of the night and they send a social worker to the, to the hospital room and my husband is sitting there and they start asking questions about our relationship and if he's abusive. And, and hello, like he, A, he's not, but if he was, you have just put me in danger by asking this right. question in front of my abuser. Right. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things like that where, where the people whose job it is or who, who could be in a position to be helpful don't actually think about the, as, as Leah hit on earlier, like those power dynamics that are just so entrenched in ableism in our, in our society. I think on top of that, like if we're talking about these statistics, a lot of the times when we see mainstream organizations working around sexual assault or domestic violence, they look at, again, disability as a monolith and, and they ask very generic questions that are just about disability and not about the intersections of disability. Um, you know, how a trans disabled person or a black trans disabled person uh, in uh, experience survivorship is going to be a lot different than a white upper class disabled person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that leads to a lot of gaps in data that negatively impact our, our communities because I mean, these people are in our communities. If we don't know where there is a big issue, how are we supposed to address it? How are we supposed to come together and figure out solutions? I think that, we need to have more mainstream organizations that are trying to include disability, talk about disability as this issue that multi-marginalized people exist in it. It's not just one monolith where we all experience the same things. Um, and that's how we can really help survivors across the disability community. No, I agree. And I think that it's a real shame that a lot of these organizations do a lot of this research and that gap is still there. And I think it's well overdue to hold them accountable for that gap still existing in 2020 going on 2021, because we do need those numbers to know who in our community are the disproportionately impacted and what supported services can we do better at providing for them? Because we don't have the data that we don't know how to serve, you know, whether you're a practitioner or whether you're an activist. So 
anyone that's listening to this who work in organizations that do this research, who utilize the research, call out your colleagues or do better yourself in getting this data because our lives literally depend on it. I think one thing I would add too that just to complexify it a little bit is that, I mean, this is just making me think about how and the national census that just happened, there wasn't a, are you disabled question, mm-hmm. right? And then I was talking about it with people and some people were like, but A, a lot of people are gonna be like, well, I don't know if it counts. A lot mm-hmm. of people are gonna be like, don't call me that word. And a lot of people are gonna be like, I don't trust the government having this information about me. Yeah. You've also got all of those really important blockages to gathering the data. And you know, every single time I do a training or organizing, um, especially in black and brown communities, like, I mean, what I always talk about is that it's not as simple, like, hey, if we're talking about putting in access stuff or asking people their access needs, so many of us have been taught that we need to minimize our disabilities and our access needs to survive. So it's not as simple as being like, let's do a check-in. You have to unpack the, you actually have to create the conditions where it's safe for people to disclose, right? I mean, that yeah. UN, that off-sited UN, you know, what is it, like 20% of the world is disabled or whatever, you know, I mean, that's low. I mean, it's probably 60%. And honestly, I, I don't think I'm being cynical in that if there was an actual, an accurate survey of how many disabled people have survived sexual violence, it'd probably be 95%. You mm-hmm. know, you really would. And then in asking about sexual assault, like, I don't know if it'd be enough to be like, have you been sexually assaulted? You're going to need to make it accessible to people who are DID disabled, lots of other things. But also it might be like, a lot of people might look at it and be like, well, no. And you'd have to open up and be like, this includes all of these things. Right. This includes medical stripping. This includes that thing that happened with that doctor when you were three years old, right? Like right. all of that. Um, and I just also want to say, you know, disabled people are speaking up. I, I meant to say this before about why don't people report. I, it just, the first thing I thought about is like, well, look at the, ki- the autistic youth in the Judge Rotenberg Center, yeah. right? I mean, they're yeah. speaking up and they're still getting shocked. So, you know, a lot of disabled people have also looked and been like, when speaking up happens, nothing happens. So, yeah, yeah, something needs to change in order for it to be worth it for people to speak up. Well, I think that's that's such a key point, too. I mean, in in the willingness, well, in the the need to respect the voices of disabled people and their experience. And I think you're right with like with the JRC. I mean, we've heard people speak out in. Um, sheltered workshops that are facing abuse. Right. I mean, I remember um, there was a uh, the same time that raped at Howard was the trending hashtag here in DC. Right there below it was raped at Gallaudet. Right. Um, and it was and it was one of those things where it was like I remember looking on Twitter and being like, oh, what's trending in DC today? And it's like raped at Howard. And I like go down the hall and I holler at my husband and I was like, your school's trending. Um, and then, like all my friends that were Gallaudet alum, um, were like, "Oh, we're like, yeah, that's not surprising, right. you know, because we don't talk about it, you know, in our spaces." I mean, within the little people community, we have just now started having like AA, like Alcoholics Anonymous, and NA groups at our conferences. And I had said to them, "I was like, why don't we have a, you know, can we set up some time for survivors?" Um, and there was like this look and they were like, well, what are you talking about? And I was like, a- assault and abuse survivors. Like, let's let's set up a-, a safe space. Let's set up a room. Let's have some like folks available. Well, that doesn't happen at conference. And it was like, what's what conference are you going to? Because the conference I'm going to, that's a thing. Um, but I think it's also, yeah, I mean, it's it's centering the voices of the people. It's creating a climate where people feel empowered to do what needs to, to do what they feel needs to be done in terms of creating spaces for those conversations um, that are by them and for them. And it's the acknowledgement that, as you all have both pointed, pointed out, that what works for white middle class folks, mm-hmm. white cisgendered middle class folks, is not necessarily going to be the same supports and services in the same centering space as for black and brown folks, trans folks, like everybody else, like everybody else in those spaces. With five minutes remaining, or less than five, what are some final thoughts that we want to share with everyone? I mean, I would love to talk about institutionalization and sexual, domestic violence, sexual violence, sexual assault. And not only when we're talking about like 
like what we think of mental institutions, everything. I'm talking about nursing homes, prisons, all these places we talk about. The, when trauma is a disability. And so these people are being traumatized a lot. Um, and they have these high sexual assault rates. And there isn't any access really to reporting because the people who are controlling them are the abusers. And like they control every aspect of their lives a lot of the time. Um, I think that I would love to see the disability community and the larger community around domestic violence, sexual assault, talk about disability institutions and how this institutionalization goes beyond prisons, goes beyond uh, mental institutions, goes beyond um, psychiatric centers, goes beyond nursing homes and just all these places that are regulating people's lives make it hard for people to report. I mean, you have an officer in a jail or in a prison sexually assaulting someone, where are they gonna go? Who are they gonna turn to? There's that code of silence, like protect each other. Um, and I mean, it's hard for even people to report. It's hard to get the statistics out there because people don't, are scared to say something happened. Um, and I would love to see more work around that. No, definitely. And I would like to add when it comes to institutions, our group homes and foster care, which a lot of our kids are in. And that's when they get their first exposure to uh, different types of abuses. Those uh, institutions need to be called out and addressed as well. Can we also add in the ICE camps, the border yes. camps, where those people are acquiring disabilities minute by minute as a result of trauma and family separation? Yeah. And nobody's talking about um, violence happening in those places. No, there's, you know, the disability. It, it's one of those things that I asked um, when a, a few years or two summers ago, the summer, the summer of ADAPT. Um, and I asked them, I was like, so what is DIA going to do for the kids at the border? that are disabled, like they're institutionalized, can they be able to use your DIA to get out of the camps? Like, has there been thinking about that? And what I was told was like, those kids aren't our kids. And I remember just being like, but they are, those are your kids. Like I, yeah, it's, I, it, it gets the Irish out in me. Um, but, uh, you know, but it really is one of those things that it's like, anywhere that people are institutionalized, this happens. And within our community, we don't like to talk about that. We, or we'll talk about it in terms of like the traditional, like old school forest haven type of institutions, because that's comfortable for folks, but they don't want to talk about prisons. They don't want to talk about psychiatric institutions. They don't want to talk about any other sort of facility. Mm -hmm. I just want to maybe end um, by lifting up the ways that we're resisting, because I think that's really important, because we've talked about a lot of really heavy duty real stuff. And I just think it's equally important to lift up that, you know, mainstream disability rights isn't looking at rape and ice camps and all that, but disability justice is. Mm -hmm. Right. So in terms of if people are like, what do we do? I'm like, look up the No Body is Disposable campaign. Look up mm -hmm. the Look up Harriet Tubman Collective. Look at Movement for Disabled Black Lives. Like, look at those groups and support them. Bring them into your sexual assault work. Um, I'm part of a roundtable talk on disability justice and abolition that the Abolition and DJ Coalition is doing next Wednesday. Please check it out. It's got carton ASL. You can Google it. It's on my Facebook. And I also just want to say that, like, disabled survivors do so much. Like, our, our strength is that we're excluded from systems, but when I think about how people are resisting without reporting, I think about like the zines that disabled survivors have met, spoken word, writing, all the online crypt communities where we find each other, where I've seen people get people out of abusive situations and save each other's lives and be like, I'm going to come over with my van and bring the ramp. And I'm going to get you or I'm going to help. And who, because we get it. You know, not only do we know what we meet, what our needs are, we have the skills that, you know, a mainstream provider might not have around, okay, I'm going to help you hire, you know, care attendants who are not your fucked up family or your husband. And I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm going to be like, that's not right. And I'm going to get where you're coming from, right? That our creativity, the ways that we crip sexuality, the ways that we are not sexual, um, the ways that we create access hacks are really, really important. And there are a well of resources to draw on. And to wrap up, I just want to say for any survivors that are watching, you have a community. Let me say that again. You have a community that's here that will believe you, that will embrace you, and that will support you. And I think that's it for our panel. Thank you to everyone that's watching. Thank you to Leah, Rebecca, and Leslie, and myself, Valissa. Thank you so much, Valissa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. you.